So welcome back. We've been in the process of laying out our timber harvest and planning it all. Uh, we have already laid out the trails and now it's time to mark the timber. Now, as we discussed in a previous video, we're gonna be performing a group selection cut based on the condition of this stand. And because it's so important to try to maintain the stability of the stand as we capture mortality and at-risk stems, we're going to have to take the time to mark out the timber we want to remove and ensure that the best choices are made across the entire harvest. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark out that timber and you can follow me along along the way and I'll kind of explain some of my thought processes and why I'm marking the timber that I'm marking. Now what I'm gonna be using today is tree paint that's kind of put in a spray paint can. Now, this is, this is somewhat different from normal spray paint. It is specially formulated for the outdoors. Uh, it tends to be a little thicker and lasts longer. Now you can use regular spray paint. I have done that before when I've had regular spray paint in my vest, you know, talking to logging contractors. I've had to go through and maybe mark out an acre of timber to kind of give them an idea of what I wanted to see. So I have done it before and it can work. The difference is it's just not quite as visible and if you expect it to last maybe over a year if you're planning far in advance of the harvest, it might not last that long in the weather conditions. And there are actually paint guns that you can use too, but they're rather expensive and they require a lot of maintenance like any you know paint tool is going to need. You're gonna have to clean it out meticulously, otherwise it's gonna get clogged up and won't work. Now I have a history of not necessarily following through with that sort of thing, so for my situation and my circumstances, uh, the spray paint, even though it might be a little more expensive per unit, uh, is definitely best for me and uh, you can make the decision of what's gonna work best for you. But I will put a link to this in the description as well as a link to where you can buy those paint guns. So let's talk a little bit about the process. Today I'm gonna be using two different colors. I'm gonna be using the yellow to mark out the trails and the blue for marking out timber outside of the trails. Now there's a specific reason why I'm using two different colors and marking these things separately. The first is that I'm going to be performing these two actions separately. Before we actually start harvesting, I'm likely gonna come out and pre-cut the trails, so the yellow makes it a little easier to do that. The second is that I'm actually going to be keeping track of the timber that I mark, and I wanna separate the volume by, by volume that we're taking out in the trails, and then volume we're taking out outside of the trails, so I can actually see the efficacy of the harvest system that I'm gonna be using. After all, it is a little bit experimental. Now what we're going to be doing to keep track of the volume is I have here in a little notebook um, a breakdown of species, so that's balsam fir, and then I have firewood, so it's really more like product class. Uh, but those are the two different products that I'm gonna be harvesting, and then I have that broken down by size class. So I have six to 10 diameter, 10 to 14, and then 14 to 18. And then for each one of those size classes, I used volume tables to kind of derive an average of what each tree would represent in terms of uh, volume. So in this case, we sell trees in terms of cords around here. In some cases, it might be board feet, which makes it a bit more complicated. But the cords, cords is fairly simple. So for example, a uh, 12 inch uh, balsam fir tree is gonna represent 0.183 cords. And so after I tally up all the trees, I can easily estimate how much volume I'm going to actually be removing. And while this isn't exactly necessary for a timber harvest, I think there can be a lot of benefit to it. It's a bit cumbersome to do in the process because timber marking can take a long time anyway, but it can make the sale of logs easier if you're planning to conduct a timber sale, so you're not going to be the one actually cutting the wood. Uh, it can help make that sale easier and kind of keep things as predictable as possible. Now you can also see up here that I have it written down trails and I have a similar table for the harvest. So like I said, I'm going to be marking down separately the wood that I remove out of trails and the wood that I remove from the normal harvest. So that's how I'm going to be organizing this today. And uh, for the balsam fir, it's also worth noting that for the uh, volume factor, I did use a species and state specific volume table for the balsam fir. However, I'm just kind of using a generic uh, hardwood volume table for the firewood. I'm gonna leave that in the description if you wanna take a look at it. So now we can go ahead and get started and uh, let's start by kind of explaining maybe the best practices for marking. Okay, so we're walking along the trails and we come across the first tree to mark off. And actually I've already tied it with a ribbon, which I just did to get the directional aspect. Um, and probably later I'll come down and take these ribbons because I don't like them just kind of, you know, littering. But uh, what we're going to do to mark this tree is we're gonna create two kind of diagonal lines like that. The diagonal aspect kind of helps you to see it across branches, and then on both sides, of course, you wanna be able to see it from both sides of the tree. But there's another thing that you might want to do. 
Now, in my case, I'm gonna be the one harvesting this stand, so I'm not necessarily worried about quality control. I know what I'm gonna be doing. But if you're not going to be the one harvesting this stand, sometimes what might be wise to do is you actually come down and make another mark down by the root collar. And that way, after the stand is, is cut, you can come and look at the stumps and see if those stumps were marked or not. And you can kind of do a little bit of quality control and make sure that the contract was fulfilled the way it was supposed to be. Now, of course, there might be reasons why uh, trees that weren't marked are going to be cut, namely trails. If you are marking the uh, stand and you're not the one driving the machine, you, you're gonna have a harder time marking out the trails, so you kind of have to have some consideration for that. Nonetheless, it's a good way to do a little bit of quality control and ensure that contractors, loggers, etc., are staying honest. So that might be in your interest. Just wanted to throw that out there. All right. Okay, so we're all done with that. That didn't really take too long because I had already laid out the trails ahead of time. But uh, let's take a look at what exactly our initial data is for the trail removal. So really what we see is we had a very light removal from the trails. Uh, we had a few small balsam fir, but most of it was actually hardwood, uh, which I'm gonna be uh, using as firewood. And out of the entire block, we only cut total about 2.5 cords. Now, this is an important concept to understand, and that's kind of what I like to call the silvicultural budget. When you enter a stand, especially in a partial harvest like this, where I really have to make sure that the stand is stable after harvest, I can only remove so much of the standing volume. If, for example, I can only remove total 40% of the stand, and I have 25% of the volume taken out just in trails, then that only leaves me, then that only leaves me an additional 15% removal. In this situation, I'm aiming for a removal of 50 cords. And when I was laying out my trails, I laid it out deliberately and meticulously to use old trails and avoid taking out large trees so I could retain as much of that silvicultural budget as possible for the removal of the main harvest. So there was a reason for all of this. And so now we're gonna start the rest of the timber marking for the actual silviculture. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna walk up and down the block systematically and spray trees for removal depending on the circumstances of the individual trees and the trees around it. So now let's begin. So we're just starting out now, and I've already come across a point that I really wanna make. Uh, so we have a small area here where there are three white spruce trees, and I really want to preserve these trees, and there are a few reasons for that. One is that white spruce is a really fast-growing species of spruce. The second is that it's a very long-lived and stable species. Balsam fir, which is the predominant softwood around here, is extremely prone to rot and blowdown. And one of the primary objectives of harvesting this stand is preserving the stability. So if I can retain a stable softwood that's gonna put on more growth and be able to spread seed with a valuable species, then I want to be able to retain that. So around this group of white spruce, we have one, two over there, and then three right over here. Around this small group, we have a rather large balsam fir. And if I remove this balsam fir, that has the benefit of not only keeping a group of white spruce stable and allowed and gives it a little more light to grow, but over here, kind of behind this group of trees, I have a patch of balsam fir that's young and has enough crown to readily respond if they get a little more light. So by removing this balsam fir over here, I can not only give these trees room to grow, but I can also grow these trees as well. And again, a selection cut is part of an uneven age management system. So that absolutely accomplishes the goal. I'm growing some stuff in the understory and I'm retaining some stuff in the overstory to keep growing. So I'm gonna mark this tree here. Now next to those spruce trees over here, we also have this young balsam fir. <laughs> now remember, while this is still young, there are two types of mortality. There's mortality from senescence, meaning the tree just gets old and dies, and also competition. Now this tree is really on its way to being outcompeted. It doesn't have much of its crown left, and it's surrounded by large aspen trees and large spruce trees. So this doesn't have much of a chance. I'm gonna remove this tree and sell it with the small log it has currently. Okay. Here we're coming across another interesting situation. 
To my left here, I have a bunch of rather small balsam fir. They don't have the largest crowns. They're kind of starting to outcompete each other. But right next to them is a group of fairly large mature balsam fir. We have this one right here, this one, and then this one off to the right. Now, this tree right here has a pretty big crack in it, a seam that has grown over. It's very likely, given this species propensity to rot, that the inside of this is fairly rotten. It's not a very valuable tree. Its uh, net growth might be negative because of that rot. We don't really know until we cut it. And we have a similar issue with this tree here, where we have a very large seam. We have one, uh, looks like woodpecker hole near the bottom. And it's very tall and it has a small crown. It's probably 20% live crown if I had to guess. Sometimes it's hard to tell from the ground. So what I'm thinking of doing, if I cut this tree, it's going to put this tree and thus this tree at risk because these trees have kind of relied on each other for quite a while. They're supporting one another. And if I remove any of them, it's very possible that these already compromised trees are going to blow down. They're just not going to be with, uh, they're just not going to be able to withstand the additional force of wind, snow, ice, etc. So I think what's best to do is if I take these down, if I take these three trees down as a small group, it allows these trees over here to retain stability as they can kind of uh, support each other. And then over here, we also have a group of very small young balsam fir, and they'll benefit from a little bit of light from this side. So again, we're kind of maintaining that uneven age structure. We're capturing the mortality of these mature fir and we're retaining stability. So that's very important wherever we go. And I'm also gonna grab this one over here for the same reason. It's kind of crooked, it's not very valuable, and it's gonna be put at risk from this opening. And there are more smaller trees over here that could benefit, so I'm gonna remove this. And I'd say that's good for this little area. So we're moving along here, and we've come to an area that really defines the groups of our group selection. Uh, now this was actually the location of uh, the video I did when I was talking about the silviculture of this stand. We have a very small group, probably, I don't know, uh, 15, 20 trees total of very large, I mean, I'll stand next to one for comparison, a very large and mat mature balsam fir, and this is not a very long-lived species. Additionally, on the ground here, we have seams that are a very good indication of internal rot. We have another one right here, and if we look up to the tops, two of them are actually dead. One of them has a broken top, and many of them have extremely small and recessed crowns. Probably, I mean, one of them is probably 5% life crown ratio. So what's going to happen is if I remove any one of these trees, well, I'm going to have to remove a lot because a lot of them are at high mortality objectively. But if I remove the high, high uh, risk trees, the low risk trees are then going to become high risk as they're vulnerable to wind, snow, etc. So the best thing to do here is just to remove this entire cohort in a very kind of small area. So we're gonna have, um, relative to the rest of the stand anyway, a pretty large little opening, but that's going to create an opportunity for regeneration to come in from the surrounding trees to kind of seed it in and allow it to grow in. Now, alternatively, I've actually toyed around with the idea of doing a little bit of interplanting, but you know, we'll, we'll see what comes of it. But for right now, the plan is to let it regenerate naturally by just creating a little opening here. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark all these trees in this little group. All right, so now all those trees are marked and you can kind of get an idea of the extent of this opening. So in the scheme of things, not very big, but it's gonna be one of the larger openings in the entire harvest. So in contrast to the group of trees up there that we selected for a removal, we kind of have an area right here where we're going to completely stay out of. Now on the, surf on the surface, it looks fairly dense, 
but this tree is dead. A lot of these smaller trees are already dead or well on their way to dying. And so if you just kind of visualize only the trees that are living, it's, it's not very dense and all of them are fairly healthy. They're growing fairly quickly, so there's no reason to cut any of those trees. Sometimes the best decision you can make is just to stay out of an area and to not cut. And that's what we're gonna do here. And uh, here we have another small patch of trees that have the same risk factors as some of the other groups we've looked at. Uh, you have some pretty severe rot in the bases, you have recessed crown, and uh, they're just reaching that point of senescence. So if I take any one of these trees, I put the other at risk, or I, I put the others at risk, so uh, I'm just going to take a group of about seven trees here. And also, there's a nice little uh, red spruce behind this one. So uh, that's, a, that's a little benefit, get to release this. This one's gonna get a lot of sunlight, it's gonna grow nice and strong. Uh, I didn't see that at first, but it actually makes me very happy. So definitely gonna remove these trees here. It's very close to this one though, so when I'm cutting it, I'll have to be careful with the chainsaw, but no, no big deal. Spruce over there, all these aspen. So I'll pick out this one. So we'll call that uh, 10 inch. I'll come in here. I'll find one. This one's all cracked up. So we'll call this one. So another 10 inch. This one's pretty large, but it seems healthy. No evidence of rot those together for stability. This one has a pretty small crown. So we'll call this one six inches. And let's remove this one. Pretty poor quality roots are kind of hummocked. Alright, and that's another probably another ten inches. All right, about six hours and a few rain showers later, we are all finished. Now you can see our final tally here. Because of the rain, it did get a little bit messy. Pro tip, if you ever write in the rain book, it doesn't work with pen, I always forget about that. <laughs> um, so our final tally is for balsam fir, we have about 38 cords that we're going to be removing. And then for firewood, including the trail wood, uh, we have about five cords. So we have about 43 cords removal in total. Now my original estimate and target was 50 cords removal. We came in a little lower and that's fine with me. We thoroughly scanned the entire stand. We looked at almost, well, really every single tree. And the trees we marked are the ones that really made sense to remove. The remaining trees are strong, healthy, they're serving some sort of purpose, they're still growing. And so we're going to make this stand as productive as possible while capturing the mortality that would otherwise, you know, leave our grip. Moreover, we're absolutely going to accomplish our goal in this stand, which is to create an uneven age stand of valuable timber. So that's all for now, guys. I'm starting to lose daylight here, but uh, this is a huge chunk of our preparation for the harvest. So now we really start to get ready and we'll be uh, starting up our chainsaws relatively soon. So if you like this, you want to see more, be sure to like and subscribe, and uh, we have a lot more coming your way. All right, until next time, later.